Hello. I would like to thank uh, Dog and Cranberry Lake Association for inviting me to share some information on improving water quality, but understanding that we do have limitations. Let's take a look at the water quality for our lakes this past summer. In 2020, Cranberry Lake, as you can see on the right, we did have a blue-green algae bloom, but it wasn't a thick pea soup like we've had in some other years. If you take a look at the samples under the microscope, you can see on the left that it was dominated by this beaded filamentous species of cyanobacteria called anabina or dolichospermum. The situation was much worse in Kingston Mills Lock. As you can see, we have a thick pea soup characteristic of a blue-green algae, which was good for Kelly Estrada because she needed this collection to feed to her snail species for her bioremediation experiments. As you can see under the microscope that the anabina species was the dominant blue-green algae. In September 2020 at the south end of Dog Lake, Janet Brown shared this image from a DCLA member who had a drone camera. And as you can see, we have an extensive pea green soup or spilled paint conditions, characteristic of a blue-green algae bloom of concern and note here is the white scum zone as the cells of the blue-green algae bloom break open if they're producing toxins. The concentration of toxins can increase at this time because the uh, toxins within the cells are then released. About a week later, when I was out at the south end of Dog Lake, Conditions had improved, but we still had a substantial blue-green algae bloom. Much to my surprise, at the latter part of October of this year, we had an extensive blue-green algae bloom in the north end of Dog Lake. As you can see from a fold scope image, which is a little pocket microscope, essentially. We had a, the filamentous beaded species. The group was anabina. Yes, it does have potential to produce more than one toxin. So what I'm going to be covering today are three lakes. Dog Lake at the south end and north end, Cranberry Lake and Colonel By Lake in particular, Kingston Mills Lock data. The questions I'd like to address were first brought out by the Three Lakes Water Quality Group, their bulletin in July 2019. Why are there so many weeds or macrophytes? Why are we seeing more blue-green algae? Why do our lakes turn green in August? And is there anything we can do about it? And we have a question from a DCLA member. Is there any correlation between rainfall, winds, and use of fertilizers on farms? So why are there so many weeds or macrophytes? Well, certainly the majority of the macrophytes are attached to the sediment. So their roots grow in the sediment. So a shallow basin favors their growth as well as the surrounding littoral zone of the deep basins. Also, we have duckweed, which floats at the surface, and that is another macrophyte. Just like land plants, the aquatic plants need nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all those other mineral elements. When I talk about plant species, I'm also going to include the cyanobacteria, which are photosynthesizers that are the toxin producers or potentially toxin producers. So anything that can photosynthesize algae that is in the plankton or algae that is uh, 
growing on the bottoms. These are all under the definition of plant when I mention plants and all plants to photosynthesize in sunlight. And surprisingly, zebra mussels can enhance the growth of macrophytes in that they filter the water for plankton. They prefer to eat algae that is microscopic. And by their removal of this algae, algae, algae group, they allow more sunlight to penetrate and enhance the growth of macrophytes. So why are there so many weeds and more blue-green algae? Well, first of all, we have to look at it as a competition between these two major photosynthetic groups. The macrophytes do very well, especially in the uh, first half of the summer when the waters aren't too hot. So they can be the macrophytes attached to the sediment or floating at the surface like duckweed. They're busy taking up nutrients and absorbing sunlight to produce uh, sugars, etc. They're in competition with the blue-green algae, but as it gets warmer above 20 degrees Celsius and the nutrient content creeps up and up, it favors the growth of blue-green algae. As you can see here, we have this thick pea soup these dark green clumps are the uh, macrophytes that are no longer doing very well. Not all blue-green algae thrives in really warm temperatures. The species on the left here, Lingbaya, is more of a cooler water species. It doesn't grow in great abundance in Cranberry Lake, but I thought I'd point it out because it's easy to recognize. And unfortunately, this species can produce toxins. It is a dark green boiled spinach looking uh, lump when it is forced to the surface by uh, gas bubbles. It's normally on the bottom, but uh, when it bubbles to the surface, that's when pets can accidentally eat this stuff and it has been known to cause death um, to dogs in the east coast of Canada. And it's easy to distinguish it from this bright green filamentous algae called a mermaid's veil or spirogyra. This grows in our cooler temperatures around uh, Cranberry Lake and Dog Lake but it does not produce toxins. So back in uh, late May, myself and uh, Alan Tian and Eden Hatley, two Queen students, put together a workshop on uh, blue-green algae blooms for the Kingston Field Naturalists. And that video is still available on the website if you want to check it out. In that video, Alan Tian briefly mentions uh, the Lake Partners Program. And here I'm going to delve more deeply into that database. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to the people who have been collecting this data over the years. It is really essential and important for understanding our water quality issues. So why does the Lake Partner Group get us to collect total phosphorus? Well, there have been a number of studies, starting with uh, David Schindler back in, um, oh, it goes back a long way, when uh, they first started adding phosphorus to uh, the environmental lakes area in Northern Ontario to see what kind of effects phosphorus had on algae growth. This is just uh, some data from a Lake Michigan study to demonstrate to you that um, TP here stands for total phosphorus. When you have high amounts of 
total phosphorus, you can expect high amounts of plant growth. And plant growth is expressed as a pigment uh, used in photosynthesis, chlorophyll A. And as total phosphorus decreases, you get a similar trajectory in plant growth. It tends to decrease in a similar manner. So it's a good indicator of uh, plant growth and water quality. So let's turn our attention to the north end station on Dog Lake, the yellow squares, Cranberry Lake in the green dots, and the black triangles are Colonel By Lake. Date is along the x-axis, and along the y-axis is total phosphorus. The first thing I'd like to point out is that at the 20 microgram per liter mark, this is our provincial water quality objective. So any values above 20, you can expect poor water quality. So the north end of Dog Lake is very close to 20 micrograms, but it does get a bit above on a regular basis from one year to the next. In uh, Cranberry Lake, we have two occasions where the total phosphorus went quite a bit above the 20 microgram per liter threshold. That was in 2016 and in 2018. We don't really have enough data for Colonel By Lake, but certainly in 2017, we had a peak. So in Cranberry Lake in 2016, what was really happening in the lake? Well, as you can see on the left here, we had a really bad year for blue green algae blooms. And it was dominated by Anabina, this species that has beaded uh, cells it is a cyanobacteria that can produce toxins. Likewise, in 2018, we had this pea soup conditions characteristic of blue-green algae bloom, dominated again by anabina. So of interest then are what could be contributing to these blooms in Cranberry Lake. The Cataract Ray Region Conservation Authority, in particular Holly Evans, has shared some data regarding low water level advisories. As you can see in 2016, there was a level one, two, and three low water level advisory. In 2018, in the middle of the summer, there was a level one low water level advisory. And then again in 2019, but at the end of the summer. If we turn our attention to the Kingston Mills lock data collected by the CRCA, as you can see along the x-axis here, they've been collecting data here for at least 20 years. Total phosphorus along the y-axis. Most of the data points are above 20 micrograms per liter, indicating that you can expect poor water quality. Most of these data points below 20 micrograms per liter were collected in winter cool season temperatures. So the first indication of whether or not we have spikes in total phosphorus in uh, warmer dry seasons were to examine 2016 and 2005, but the real um, indicator or lack of pattern was shown in 2012 when we had uh, two low water level advisories, but not a big spike in total phosphorus. And if you look before that date and after that date, you have quite the contrast. Um, so showing no pattern or correlation with rainy seasons or dry seasons. But what is of interest is that uh, over a 20 year period, the total phosphorus has been on the decrease, which I thought was rather interesting. Even though we still have poor water quality, things have been improving. And likewise, a study done, done by Sonnenberg and others, where they did a paleo 
coring of the uh, Colonel By Lake, they concluded that there has been a slowdown in eutrophication in Colonel By Lake, and they attributed that to improved sewage uh, containment and treatment. So if we look a little further into water level changes from the Parks Canada website at uh, Kingston Mills, a water level drop this year of only 13 centimeters, whereas at Upper Brewers Locks close to, uh, well, where Cranberry Lake flows in, we had a drop in water level of 39 centimeters. So a different uh, scenario Colonel By Lake has a much larger water catchment. Total phosphorus is typically above 20 micrograms per liter, but it has been slowing down in eutrophication for the last 50 years or so. And water level is being controlled by Parks Canada, but it doesn't fluctuate as much as um, Upper Brewers Mills. So if we want to turn to a good example of increased precipitation, washing farm fertilizer into a lake, Lake Erie in the West End is a good example of blue-green algae blooms increasing during years of high rainfall. So all of these severe bloom periods are all during years of high precipitation, 2015, 2017, 2019, higher precipitation than in 2016, 2018, and 2012. And you will recall that in Cranberry Lake, we had high BGA blooms in 2016 and 20, 2018, so quite the opposite to what is happening in Lake Erie. So now if we take a look at the south end of Dog Lake, in this region here, we have stations with Lake Partner Program data for Milburn Bay, Fiddler's Elbow, and these two stations are within 750 meters of each other and are very representative then of this south basin. We have date along the x-axis going back to 2004. The provincial water quality objective line is down here. So most of the phosphorus levels in the south end of Dog Lake are unfortunately above this water quality objective. So you can't expect um, good conditions here. Now if we take a look at uh, low water level advisories from the CRCA, in 2016 and 2018 this is when we had spikes in total phosphorus in Cranberry Lake and this is also the case in the south end of Dog Lake. A spike here and a spike here. And then if we have a look at 2012. This is a year of two low water level advisories as well. And we have this spike in total phosphorus. Milburn Bay is a different situation, however. We'll address that in a moment. But as you have summers with warmer above average temperatures and a large surface area, then you're going to get a lot of evaporation. If that's also in addition with very low precipitation, and of course people need to continue to use water, then you have this big water level drop. And even if your total phosphorus values stays the same, they, the phosphorus that is there is concentrated and will promote more growth. So if we look at the rainy seasons and the cooler seasons, if we had a Lake Erie situation bringing 
a lot of farm fertilizer in during rainy seasons than you would expect in 2017 to see a spike in total phosphorus, but there's a drop. And in 2013, we have a drop in total phosphorus and also in 2004, low values of TP. Milburn Bay has a peak in 2019 and uh, 2019 was more or less an average sort of um, precipitation year. So now if we looked at the overall trends, unlike Colonel Bay Lake, the uh, values are trending upward. So over time, between 2004 and 2012, TP is increasing and total phosphorus continues to increase at the Green Square Station. Melbourne Bay, however, spikes in 2019. So perhaps in Melbourne Bay, as seen here from Alan Tian's drone photo taken in 2019, his study season, you can clearly see where Milburn Creek is inflowing. The uh, blue-green algae are more or less aligned with the direction of flow. But if you wanted to assess how much phosphorus is flowing in from the creek, you would really need to go out and sample that specifically. So why do our lakes turn green in August? Because the wind speeds are at their lowest during this month. Plant nutrients are often at a maximum. It's one of the warmer seasons along with July. And when you have a very warm, dry month, then and you also get a lot of evaporation, that all contributes to uh, decreasing water levels and of course land use. So what can we do about our water quality problems? We do have nutrients in excess and increasing. Have we reached the carrying capacity of the lake? Well, the definition that I'm referring to is the maximum population of the species that a particular ecosystem can sustain. So what can we do about it? If residents, the township, and governmental agencies are to make water quality a top priority, then first of all, we need to accept that climate warming is impacting water quality. Second of all, if we're approaching carrying capacity of our lakes, then we need to seriously be looking at the question, should we be limiting development? There are solutions. We can err on the side of good water quality by adopting efficient water usage, reducing phosphorus, and removing phosphorus through bioremediation methods. So let's take a look at ways that we can remove phosphorus. The Manitoba Prairie Lakes Science Group have extensively studied the issues surrounding problematic blue-green algae. If we remove macrophytes from a lake system, you're actually causing a loss of habitat for fish and other species. The roots are embedded in the sediment and by pulling them up you disturb and release nutrients back into the water column. Also, if you take away the macrophytes, you're taking away the competition for nutrients, and that leaves more nutrients for blue-green algae growth. These are probably some of the reasons why you do need a permit from Parks Canada to remove macrophytes. So what I'm suggesting is a partial removal of macrophytes what I mean by that is, as boating becomes more frequent and popular in July and August, propellers 
tend to pull out the macrophytes and they wash to our shorelines where we can collect them up and compost them in our backyards or in the township central composting area. That way, the nutrient rich plant material can be brought back to the terrestrial environment. Also, it would be great to have a weed cutting service where they could be called upon to cut the weeds more than once during a season and then the material is composted back to the terrestrial environment. Each time this is done, of course the plants would start to grow again, but in their growth, they're taking up more nutrients. And in this way, we're removing phosphorus, for example, from the system. The idea that the Manitoba Prairie Group have studied extensively that I really um, favor is the floating treatment wetlands. Here on the right, you can see that they're roughly three meters by three meters. They put uh, cattails in the center and they can access the nutrients and water through a open perforated uh, bread basket. Here in uh, Kenora, Ontario, we have the experimental lakes area and they've tested these floating treatment wetlands in these particular lakes. Lake 227 has been eutrophied that is, uh, nutrients have been added for a number of years, but still the level of phosphorus is not as high as, for example, in Melbourne Bay. What I want to point out is that Lake 114 is a low nutrient lake, so cattails did not take up a lot of nutrients because there were not a lot of nutrients available. In contrast, at Lake 227, the cattails took up a good portion of phosphorus and most of it was sequestered or taken up by the roots. So different parts of the plant, depending on the type of plant, will take up different amounts of nutrients. So I did some comparisons. Milburn Bay Region A here, compared to the experimental lakes study, if we had 10 platforms, it would take roughly 10 to 11 years to remove 10 micrograms per liter of phosphorus, which is a substantial amount of phosphorus. However, it would probably take less than that time because the nutrient level in Milburn Bay is much higher than in the experimental lake 227. Now, if we up the platforms to 30, then it would only take 3.6 years to remove that amount of phosphorus, or it would take even less than that. Where would we place these floating treatment platforms? Here in Milburn Bay, we already have a substantial cattail marsh on the northwest end. The platforms could be placed alongside. The only difference being that we would remove these cattails at the end of the growing season and compost them back into the environment. Other species could be planted on these platforms and incorporated into the shoreline restoration project. Either way, the cost of one platform would be approximately $630, and it would also be um, of interest to have a lab analysis of the plant material to get an idea of how much phosphorus was being removed. In summary then, why are there so many weeds? 
certainly we have plenty of shallow substrate for them to anchor to, and there are nutrients in excess. But macrophytes are good competitors and take up nutrients that would otherwise be available for cyanobacteria growth. So why do our lakes turn green in August? This is the time of year when winds are at their lowest and it is one of the warmest, driest months. Why are we seeing more blue-green algae blooms? Over the last couple of decades, we have seen a documented warming trends in Ontario. And of course, we have total phosphorus amounts in excess. Any correlation between rainfall amount and use of fertilizers on farms? Certainly over the last 16 years, the Lake Partner Program data for the South Basin has uh, certainly shown an increase in total phosphorus. Is this from farms, homes, sewage, or fertilizer? Really, we need to have a, a more extensive nutrient budget study to pinpoint the sources. However, in uh, late October, a BGA bloom in the north end certainly is suggestive of a rain event bringing nutrients in, but it could also be due to internal mixing during a fall turnover. Melbourne Bay in 2019 had a spike in uh, total phosphorus in July and August. This could have been a rain event bringing nutrients in. As you saw from the drone photo, the Melbourne Creek is flowing into the bay and could be most likely is bringing in nutrients through there. The strongest correlation was between cyanobacteria blooms and low water levels. During above average warming, we have a lot of evaporation, often low precipitation, and of course, water usage has to continue. So that leads to the question, have we reached the carrying capacity for these basins? The good news is we can err on the side of good water quality by adopting efficient water usage, reducing phosphorus loading to our basins by following CRCA guidelines, Watershed Canada's shoreline restoration initiatives, and we can even remove phosphorus through bioremediation such as composting weeds and leaves that wash to our shorelines and building floating treatment wetland platforms that have plants on them that will take up the nutrients and then those can be composted back onto the land. So I wanna thank you for your attention and if you have any further questions, send me an email. I'll be glad to look into it.